We are in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 26. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open up your Bible. If you don't, there's a Bible underneath the seat in front of you. You're welcome to uh, take one of those and join along. We're going to be covering uh, two chapters tonight. We're going to chapter 26, chapter 27. We're looking at the life of David. Incredible lessons that that David is learning. And I, I think along with David, you know, you and I have the opportunity to learn as well. And I, I remember hearing long ago, you know, you, you, you can learn lessons two ways. You can learn lessons by having to go through them the hard way and have to get, you know, beat up and slapped down or whatever. <laughs> I mean, you can, or you can learn the lessons by watching others go through them and go, oh, I, you know, I, 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 I learned that from watching them rather than having to do it myself. And I think that's one of the cool things about, you know, opening up the scriptures. We, we, we got the life story of men who walked with God and, and the trials and the tribulations that they endured. And then you and I have the opportunity to take those things and go, man, I, I just learned how to handle a situation so that I don't have to learn the hard way. And, and hopefully, you know, as we're going through the life of David, one of the things that amazes me about David, remember, remember this, David was a man after God's own heart. And yet David had his own failures, his own, his own faults. He, 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 didn't, he wasn't perfect by any means. And, and yet here's a man who wanted to know God and wanted to follow God and wanted to serve God with his life. And so God has been teaching David the lessons that would be necessary. He's going to become the king of Israel. And, you know, if you're going to learn how to be a king, it's, it, it takes, uh, you know, it takes a little bit of uh, boot camp. Right? You're, you're going to have to learn how to lead. You're going to have to learn how, how, to, how to follow. And God is teaching David these things. Now, if you remember, in chapter 24, David, he's been chased by Saul. Saul's the king. David is the to-be king. And he's being hunted by the king. Saul hates him. He hates him because he sees God is already has his hand upon David and he wants to destroy David's life to prevent him from taking the throne. And so David is out running, but the, the cool thing is, is that David is putting his trust in the Lord, right? As he's running, God's guiding him and directing him. So much so that David's hiding in a cave. And it just happens that Saul, his enemy, who's trying to kill him, comes into that very cave that David's hiding in with his men, and he has to relieve himself. And as he's there, David's able to take the corner of his robe and cut it off. Now, he had the opportunity to kill him. And it would have been, from human perspective, justifiable. But as he went to cut the robe off, it says that David's heart was moved. And he realized that I can't raise my hand up against God's anointed. That's God's job, not my job. And so what does David do? He lets him go, and then he goes to the other side of the mountain. He says, hey, Saul, I could have killed you right now. But because I honor God, I, I, I couldn't do it. The very next chapter, and we looked at it last week, David uh, takes care of some sheep of a, of a very wealthy man. And he was expecting that this man would compensate him for caring for his sheep while they were in the wilderness. They lost nothing while David and his men were there. They, you know, treated them very fairly, very, very, you know, honorably. And so we asked him as a feast day comes, he asked him, hey, can, can you guys give us a little bit of food? Can you help us out? You know, there's 600 men out here and, you know, we, we could use a little bit of rations right now. And the guy goes, oh, who, I don't know you nothing. You know, the guy was just rude. And David loses it. He's, he wants to go kill the guy. And, and he's already told 400 of his men that we're going to go in, take your sword, we're just going to chop him into pieces. That, that was his plan. Now, Again, 
the natural man wants to respond in, in, in you know, a natural way. You know, I'll, I'll show him. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll defend myself. I'll, I'll, I'll get what's mine. You know, that, that's our natural reaction. Except that the wife of Nabal comes and she meets him before he gets there and she pleads with him not to do what he's about to do because he would have guilt and blood on his hands. She brings him food and she brings him, you know, all, all the, the, you know, necessary uh, food. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Supplies. That was the word I was looking for. And David, at the end of that, comes in and, you know, what, what he does is he acknowledges. God used you today to spare me from having this guilt on my own hands. And, and he, he honored Abigail for doing so. And, and Abigail's just an incredible woman, you know, just pleading uh, for her husband's life, but also pleading for the king not, not to be guilty uh, later on down the road. And, and so, you know, he, he does that. And it's, it's wild because Abigail goes back home to her husband, tells her husband the next morning he was drunk, Wakes up the next, next morning. I love the Bible. Just kind of lays it all out there, huh? You know, they're, they're, he was partying all night. <laughs> Abigail says, you know what? Last night you could have died. David and his 400 men were coming to kill you. And it says that his heart froze and he, for 10 days, was in a coma. And on the 10th day, he died. And the news got back to David and David goes, hey, God took care of Nabal, and Abigail happens to not have a husband. She's a, she's a beauty. And he asks Abigail to marry him, and he takes her as his wife, right? So, so I mean, th think about all of these things that's happening up until this point. And, and I share this with you guys because I think it's the lessons that David is learning as he's going the way. I, I need to trust the Lord, not try to avenge myself, not, not, not try to take things in my own, own hands, and, and I think as we come to chapter 26, we see that play out. I think David learned a lesson, and now he's going to go through the, another test. And as he goes through this test, he, you're, you're going to see how David responds to that test. Notice chapter 26, verse 1. Now the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is David not hiding in the hill of Hecola opposite Jessamon? Now, let me explain a little something. Saul had already said, David, you know, you're right. I'm wrong. I'm not going to chase you anymore. You're safe as far as I'm concerned. You're not going to. And, and then here comes the Ziphites. Now, the Ziphites are the ones that told Saul the first time that David was in, you know, a particular region. And it seems as though the Ziphites are now afraid. If David comes into power, we ratted him out once. We better get rid of him. And so we got to go. You know, tell Saul, this is where he's at. You can catch him over here. And notice verse 2. And Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And here comes Saul again. Goes back on everything he said. He, he just kind of laid everything that he had promised last time kind of aside. And now he's chasing David Another time. And, and, and here, here's, here's what's wild, man. When, when someone is, is just, you know, determined that they're going to do their will over God's will, nothing's going to stop them from doing that. Not, not even their word, not even the promises, not, not even God. <laughs> because that person has already given himself over to his flesh. And Dave, Saul at this point, man, has given himself over to his own passion, his own desires. You know, he, I, I'm going to kill David, you know, and the, all it took was someone to come along for, you know, the Ziphites to come along and say, hey, we know where he's at, David, let's go get him. And David's like, I mean, Saul, God, you know, we're, I'm in. And so they chased David down again. Verse 3, and Saul encamped in the hill of Hikola, which is opposite of Jeshimon by the road. And David stayed in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him in the wilderness. And David, there were, David therefore sent out spies and understood 
that Saul had indeed come. So David arose, came to the place where Saul had encamped, and David saw the place where Saul lay, and Abner, the son of Ner, the commander of his army, and Saul lay within the camp with the people and camped all around him. And David answered and said to Ahimelech, the Hittite, and to Abishai, the son of Zerah, brother of Joab, saying, who will go down with me to Saul in the camp? And Abishai said, I'll go down with you. And so David and Abishai came to the people by night, and there Saul was sleeping within the camp with his spear stuck in the ground by his head, and Abner and the people laid all around him. Now, here's the picture. You know, again, think about what's happening here. David realizes Saul's out here again. This is crazy. And, and he gets one of his men, he goes, you want to go with me down there, you know, and we'll, we'll just go into the camp. And, and you know, he, Abishai the Hittite, or Ahimelech the Hittite. Ahimelech goes, I'm out. Now, this is wild. I, 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 Ahimelech, he wasn't even a Jew, he was a Hittite. But he had seen the hand of God upon David all of this time. And he's going, you know what, if God's in this, man, I want to be part of it. <laughs> I love that. And so, so Hamlet goes, hey, let's go down there. They walk over, and there's the whole camp with 3,000 men. Okay, picture, picture this. 3,000 men. And, you know, guys, that's, that's a pretty big spread, isn't it? 3,000 3, men. And the center of them is Saul with Abner, who's his second in command, he's his right-hand man. And David and Ahimelech walk right up to Saul's camp. Is there something wrong with that picture? He just, he just kind of just mows, he's riding, you, know, you ever been in a campsite? At dark? <laughs> and he just kind of, they just kind of weave right up there, right to where David's lying there, and, and, and they're standing over Saul a second time the opportunity to kill him. And, and check this out. And David answered and said to Himelech, the Hittite, no, 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 verse, I'm, I'm way behind. Verse eight, and Abishai said to David, now Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, the, now the, think about this, it's Abishai. Abishai, who's David's, right-hand man at this point. He says, look, God's the one who allowed this to happen. We're not standing here in the middle of all of these people by accident. God's the one who's delivered him into your hands, your enemy. And, and, it, and here, here, here's what I'm convinced of. David had already determined that he wasn't going to avenge himself. And so Abishai's trying to talk him into it. Look, God's the one who allowed you to... Now, now David knows, you know what? God's never going to have me do something that's against his will or against his word. And I think that's something important for all of us to know. Guys, God will never ask you to do something or set up a situation where he's, that he's going to say, do something that I said you're not to do in my word. It'll never happen. Because God will never contradict himself. He'll never tell you to do something that he's already declared to be wrong or sin. So you, you, you can't use that as a justification. Well, you know, we just kinda, we, we're, we're just kind of living together, but, you know, we prayed and God said it was okay. No, he didn't. That's a lie. Because God will never tell you to do something that's against what he's already declared. He'll never do it. And what's, what's wild is that Ab, here is this friend of Abishai saying, look, God's put him into your hand. And then I, I love this next one. Watch what he says. Now, therefore, please let me strike him at once with a spear right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. <laughs> he goes, David, you don't even have to do it. Just let me do it. And, and, and it's almost like, I, I know you, you, know, you, you, you don't want to feel guilty. You don't want to have this on your own head. You don't want to be walking in shame. So I'll do it for you. And, you know, I mean, he's got the spear right there. And he could, have, he, could have, he could have easily done it. And then look at David's response. And this is what amazes me, man. Look at David's response. And David said to Abishai, 
do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him or his day shall come to die or he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But please take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head and let us go. Wow. Wow. And, and, and I, I think it was the lesson he learned in chapter 25. You know what? I can't avenge myself. That's God's business. Remember Nabal? Died 10 days later. He, he, he knew, you know what? I, I, I'm not going to avenge myself. I'm going to let God do my battle. I'm going to let God do my fighting for me because then I'm not going to be guilty. Now it's on God. That's God's business. Guys, and I, I think that's a lesson for all of us, man. If we would just be willing to say, you know what, I'm going to trust the Lord and I'm not, I'm not going to try to avenge myself or I'm not going to try to fight this battle on my own power. I'm going to let the Lord fight this battle for me. Then what happens? You're now being shaped into a man or a woman who's what? Who's growing in your relationship with God and in your faith in God. And that's what God's doing with David now. He's learning the lessons of faith. Faith is trusting the Lord when you don't understand, when it don't make sense. When you, you can't even, you know, fathom how would God ever get me out of the situation? I got to take it in my own hands rather than trusting the Lord. And yet David was able to proclaim, you know what? The Lord is going to strike him down. The Lord is going to, you know, kill him or He's going to go out to a battle and he's going to be killed. But you know what? That's not my job. Because I want to remain guiltless. And, and that, that should be a priority for every one of us. That You know what? I, I, I don't want blood in my hands. I don't want to do something that, that is going to be an offense to the Lord. And so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pursue that avenue that would do so. And, I, you know, it, it's, it's amazing because it's the Holy Spirit working in the life of David, convicting David, teaching David. And now no, notice this, look at verse 12. So David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head. They got away and no man saw or knew it or awoke. Check this out. For they were asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. Isn't that cool? Because they were able to walk in the middle of the camp because God had put to sleep 3,000 men. A deep sleep. I, 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 like, I like when the Lord gives you a deep sleep. Right? <laughs> You're just one of those like, man, you, you could drive a train through my bedroom and I'm not going to wake because you just, that's what these guys are in. Because God was the one who was going to fight this battle for David. And it didn't make sense except God. And, and ex exact, exactly what takes place, man, the Lord put a deep sleep on them. And as they're lying, you know, the, all these guys are lying there. All of a sudden, David, watch this. They go to the other side, verse 13. They went over to the other side. They stood on the top of the hill afar off at a great distance being between them. And David called out to the people, to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, do you, no, you not answer, Abner? Then Abner answered and said, who are you calling out to the king? And David said to Abner, are you not a man? That, that, that's, that's how you get a guy's attention. Are you not a man? <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, you, you, you want to get somebody, it's, it's kind of like, what are you, a wimp? What, what, are, what are you, a, 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 you know, a little, little uh, unable to defend? That, that's really what, what he's declaring to, to Abner. Watch, watch this, this is crazy. And Abner answered, who are you calling out to the king? And he said, are you not a man? And, who's, and who is like you in Israel? Why have you not guarded your lord the king? For one of the people came in to destroy your, your lord the king. The things you have done is not good. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die. And the Lord, the Lord because you have not guarded your master, the Lord's anointed. Watch this. And now see, we, he, where... 
the king's spear is and the jug of water that was by his head. And Saul knew David's voice, and he said, Is that your voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. He said, Why does my lord thus pursue his servant? And what have I done, or what evil is in my hand? Now therefore, please, let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If the lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is the children of men, may he... they." Be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day from sharing in the inheritance for the Lord of the Lord, saying, "Go serve other gods." Now, now th- th- this is the whole thing. David is pleading his case with Saul another time, and he's saying, "Look, Saul, if I've wronged you, man, I, I want to make this right. I want to take an offering to the Lord. I, I want, I want to make sure that there's peace between us. I, I don't, you know." know what I've done wrong, but if I've done wrong, then let me fix it between me and the Lord and between me and you. And if, it's, if this is men stirring you against me, may they be cursed. You know, I, 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 I love David's perspective. You know, if I failed, then I, I want to make it right. But if it was someone that's stirred, you know, causing you to do this, then man, may, may God deal with them. You know, what, what a great perspective that David had. It, it was, it was, I, I'm open. I, I'm open to correction. I'm open to, you know, if, if I failed in some way, if I've done something wrong, I want to make it right. But if this is all just a, a, a stirring of someone else, then may God deal with that person. No, you know, as we get to this point, think, think about how David feels betrayed by Saul. He, he, he was his best servant, his most loyal servant. He had fought every battle that Saul had sent him on, and now Saul's trying to kill him. Here's all of these men that were alongside David in the battle, part of this 3,000 that's now chasing him. Remember, David was his best warrior, and here you have chosen men, some of the best warriors in Israel. They, you, know, they, you know that they uh, rubbed shoulders, that they were fighting together. And, and yet David, in all of this, is willing to put all of it in the hands of God. Willing to say, you know what, if, if there's something that needs to be made right, I, I'm willing to do whatever that would take to do so because I want God's will in my life. I don't care what man wants. Guys, that, that, that's a great, because think, think about how many times we want to avenge ourselves. We want vengeance for someone who's done wrong on our behalf. Rather than saying, you know what, God, I, I, I'm going to trust you to handle this situation. And, and David Man, so honorably, so, so nobly. You know, it wasn't that David was, wasn't afraid of a fight. He had, he, had, he had every ability to stick Saul to the ground that day. It was that David was wanting to put God on the throne of his own life. And I, I think there's, there's really what, what's, what's noble in anyone's life. When you're willing to stand back and say, you know what, I, I, I want God to be in that position. I, I want God to be the one who f- defends me, who fights my battles for me. I, I, I don't want to do this in my own, but I'll mess it up. I know that. But if it's God, then, it, then it, it's going to be done, you know, honorably. And so here, here da- David lays it all out, all out there. And look at verse 20, man. So now. Do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea, as when one hunts a partridge in the mountains. And Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will harm you no more, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. Wow. Saul confesses. You know, there, there, there's, there's two kinds of repentance, and, and really this, this is the form of repentance. There's a repentance that leads to a changed life. It means, you know, when, when I, I acknowledge that I'm wrong, it, it causes me so much that I, I'm, I'm going to make a, 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 a different course for my life. 
But then there's a repentance that never changes anything. It's just an emotional response. It's just like, you know what, I'm busted right now, but you know, I, as soon as I get out of here, you know, I'm going to go back and do whatever I want to do. And that was Saul. He had tears that were not leading to repentance. They, they were just tears. He just acknowledged, you know what, I'm the wrong guy here, but the next chance I get, the next opportunity I get, if, I, if, if Saul had David there with the spear next to his head, you can guarantee Saul would have took that chance, that opportunity. And I believe David knows that. How, you know how many times David had seen Saul's spear flying by his head? How many times he had seen him, you know, trying to, to pursue after him and kill him, and God would always deliver him out of every situation, and here he is saying, you know what, this time I mean it. Yeah, right. And David answers it, here is the king's spear. Let one of your young men come over and get it, and may the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness, for the Lord delivered you into my hand today, but I would not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed and indeed, as your life was valued much this day in my eyes, so let my life be valued much in the eyes of the Lord and let him deliver me out of all tribulation. God, do you see what David's, where he's at now? He goes, look, in the same way that I valued your life, I'm not depending on you to value my life. I'm depending on the Lord to value my life. All of his confidence isn't in man. All of his confidence is in the Lord. He, he knew that, you know, man would fail him. And, and let me tell you something, man will fail you. And if you're putting your eyes on men, you're just setting yourself up for failure. But if you put your eyes on the Lord, you will never be in that position. You'll never be let down. Because God will never fail you. And, 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 I, and I, I, love, I love that David said, look, I put my hands on the Lord and the Lord will deliver me out of all tribulation." There's something in David that, that, that you know, he, he understands now. He, he gets. You go back and read the Psalms, and how many of those Psalms that, that David is just saying, you know what, the Lord is my defense. The Lord is my strong tower. The Lord is, is my, you know, shield and my buckler. Because David understood this idea that, that God was going to be the one who fights the battles for him. And the sooner you learn that lesson, the better off you'll be. The sooner I learn that lesson, you know, the better off I'll be. And, and you can learn that lesson by trying to take it into your own hands over and over again and failing, or you can learn that lesson by going, man, look what God did for Saul, for David. And, and what, what's amazing is, at, well, look at verse 24. I mean, very, verse 25, and Saul said to David, may you be blessed, my son David. You shall both do great things and also still prevail. So David went on his way and Saul returned to his palace. Now, you know, may the Lord bless you, David, with his fingers crossed behind his back. Now, we don't know how much time between chapter 6 and 27. It, it could have been days, it could have been months, it could have been, you know, years. But when we get into chapter 27, and, and, and guys, th th this, this is, this is, this is mind-boggling. Because after all of that, David is going to turn his confidence into his own feelings rather than to the Lord. And I think, again, you know, you, you just realize that we have that tendency. I don't know about you, but, but there's days where, man, I'm just like, man, I, I just want to conquer the world. God's going to take care of it. And then the next morning I wake up and I'm like in a deep depression. You know, like, Lord, what's happened? Why did you leave? You know, <laughs> they're just those, you know, we, we, we just, we, we have that tendency in all of us. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask you to turn 
before we even get into chapter 27, turn to Psalm chapter 13. This is a psalm written right when chapter 27 is taking place. Psalm chapter 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemy say I have prevailed against him, lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. This is David. This is the Psalm of David. And this, this is, you know, right after he has the opportunity to, to spear Saul. And, he, you know, the very, next, the very next thing that happens, it says that, that David is in despair. David is, is in the dumps. David's in depression. Look, look, look at chapter 27. Look, look at verse 1 now. Check this out. And David said in his heart, now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines and Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel so I shall escape out of his hand. What? What happened? And, and I, think, I think here's the lesson for us, guys. It, 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 I think all of it there in verse 1, David said in his heart. And now he's allowing his feelings to dictate his direction rather than trusting the word. Remember God, God had anointed David to be king. Samuel came and took that bask of oil and he just threw it over David's head and he, and he said, you're going to be the next king of Israel. Do you remember that? Everyone that David would run into, God's anointed you to be the next king. Abigail, Saul even acknowledged that. I mean, you know, Jonathan, I mean, everyone's telling David, David, God's already anointed, you're going to be the king. And here David's thinking, I'm going to die. Wait a second, if God said you're going to be the king, how can you die? That's, that, that's in direct opposition of to, to what God has declared to be true. But you can get so caught up into your feelings, your emotions, that you forget what God says to be true. And you know know what Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17, 9, this is a good verse to memorize. The heart is deceitful above all things. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? (laughs) Our hearts are wicked. That's why you can't lean on your own heart. You can't lean on your own feelings. You can't, you can't, you know, well, I, I, I just, I, I'm just, I'm just, I don't want to get out of bed today. Stop it. Because you need, you need to put your confidence in truth and what God declared. And, and if God's already declared this, why, why are you doing it? And this is David, this is David's, this is David's decision. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run into the arms of the enemy so that I can be safe. Does that sound very good? But that was, that was his conclusion. I'm going to run to the Philistines who hate Israel, who are the enemies of God, so that, I, so that Saul doesn't kill me. And, and you, you, know, you know what the funny thing is here, guys? He's going to run to the king of Gath, Akish. Do you guys remember, it was a couple chapters back? When David first fleed, he ran to the Philistines. And Achish was, and, and Gath was a place where Goliath, the home of Goliath. And David, everyone starts to find out that's David, the one that they sing the songs about. David, you know, Saul's killed a thousand, David is 10,000. And David got fearful that they were going to kill him. So he started acting like a madman and foaming out of his mouth and drooling, you know, scratching on the fence and, you know, acting like a crazy guy. 
That, 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 that was just a couple chapters ago. And David, this is my conclusion. I'll go back to the place I just did that. But that, when, when your heart leads you rather than truth and God, that, that's exactly where you'll go. Right back to your vomit. <laughs> right back to your drooling. Right back where you're acting like a madman. And any, any time we, we decide that, that, that we're going to run into the enemy's arms, that's basically what we're doing. We're acting like madmen, madwomen, going where you know God just delivered me from that, and yet I'm going to run back there to find my comfort or to find my safety or to find my peace. Or to... Guys, that's crazy. They, 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 they would even consider that running to the Philistines was the better place than trusting in the Lord. But anytime you f- allow your heart to dictate to you, you'll, you'll find yourself in the same place. Your heart cannot rule you. God's word has to rule you. And no, no, notice, notice what happens, man. This is, this is wild. Let me, let me read you one more proverb. We're talking about the heart. The, the, Proverbs 28, 26. Let me read this to you. This, this is one, write this down. Proverbs 28, 26, it says this. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but whoever walks wisely will be delivered. Not a great proverb. He who trusts in his own heart is a fool. That's wisdom. And, and, and the reason God declares that to us is so that we don't act like fools. And David, at this point, you know, all of this great faith he demonstrated, and, you know, here we are, a, a chapter later, he's a fool. Because, because that, that's really what our heart does to us. It, it, it kind of vacillates between right and wrong. That's why you can't trust it. Because it'll, it'll, it'll deceive you. The heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? You know what the second part of that verse is? I, the Lord, know your heart. <laughs> I like that. Now no, notice this. Look, look, look at verse, verse 2. And David arose and went over with the 600 men who were with him to Achish, the son of Moab, king of Gath. And David dwelt with Achish in Gath, he and his men, each man with his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the Carmelitess, Nabal's widow. Now, again, you know, the whole two-wife thing, just he's blowing it, okay? Just don't, don't think, well, David did it. No, not good. And it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, so he sought him no more. And David said to Achish, if I have now found favor in your eyes, let me... Give me a place in some town in the country that I may dwell there, for why should your servants dwell in the royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziklag that day. And therefore Ziklag had belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. And the time that David dwelt in the country of the Philistines was one full year and four months. Now, now kind of can get, get the picture again. David goes over to this Philistine. Somehow the Philistine embraces him, the king of, of Gath, gives him a city to live in. And for one year and four months of his life, David's there living in the enemy's camp, in the enemy's backyard. And it, it, it almost reads out as though, as though David thinks he's getting away with it, that, he, that you know, he's succeeded in his plot, in his plan. And, but it, we won't get there tonight. Chap, next week in chapter 28, next time we're together in chapter 28, chapter 29, we're, we're, we're going to see that David ends up digging a bigger hole for himself. He's gonna, the, uh, that king, the Philistine, wants him to go fight against his, the, the children of Israel. And God spares him again. But then he goes back to the camp and then all of the camp had been raided and taken away into captivity. The men in the camp wanted to stone David because he had made the decision to go, you know, and I mean, you know, David found himself in this horrible situation because he 
veered. Because he let his heart dictate to him what was right rather than trusting God. There's an interesting passage. We'll, we'll, we'll get there, and we'll, it'll be several weeks before we get there. But David, it, it says this, and David comforted himself in the Lord. They're trying to stone him. The 600 guys that, had, that he was leading, are, you know, now they're going, David, it's all your fault. You know, they're picking up rocks. And he says, D David found his comfort in the Lord. It, I, I don't even know what that means. But it was the next, it's the next time we see David pray. And it's right after that that God elevates David to the position of king. Again, the lessons. You, you can't trust your own heart. You can't trust man. You can't trust your own heart. Because your heart will, will, will let you down. It'll, it'll lead you astray. It'll put you right there in the enemy's camp. And, and, and David here is, is there, you know, for one year and four months. And for one year and four months, David's life wastes away. I, I don't know about, about you, man. I, I can tell you this. I, I remember I got saved when I was about 12 years old. I mean, I, I had a radical conversion at 12 years old. I, I mean, I had, man, just the Lord just blew my mind. I, I, I would... Um, have dreams with the Lord. I mean, I, I mean, I, 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 God radically touched me when I was 12. Some gifts of the Holy Spirit that I had. I mean, God, but then I kind of started following my own path and started partying and drinking and, you know, getting high and doing all of these things. You know, I was just going down that road. And for 10 years, from 13 to 23 years old, man, I walked away from the Lord. I was in the enemy's camp for 10 years. And, and you know, you realize I'll never get those 10 years back. Those are 10 years of my life that were wasted doing stupid things because I let my heart and my feelings and my wants and my own desires rule me. And you, and you look back on it. I remember, I remember coming back to the Lord at age 23, and, and you know, I, I, I was just so excited that God would forgive me, and he had brought me back in, and you know, this whole, you know, there was just a moment, but I remember after it settled in, it, it was just kind of like, man, what, what were you thinking? Ten years of your life, you threw away, and you gave them to the devil. Really? I was mad at myself. I mean, I, I was literally just so frustrated that, you know, I, I had been deceived. I, I had been so easily swayed. And I gave the enemy 10 years of my life. Regret it to this day. David, for one year and four months, man, is living in the, with the enemy. No, no, notice this. And, and you know, you, what happens is you make one decision and it leads what to another decision. Look, look at verse, verse 8. And David and his men went out and they, they raided the Geshurites and the Gerzazites and the Amalekites. For those nations were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as you go to Shur, even as far as the land of Egypt. And whenever David attacked the land, he left neither man nor woman alive, but he took away the sheep, the oxen, the donkey, the camels. The apparel returned and came to Akish. And Akish would say, where have you made a raid today? And David would say, against the southern area of Judah and against the southern area of the, of the Jehoramelites, those guys, and against the southern area of the Kenites. And David would save neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, saying, lest you should inform on us, saying, thus David did, and thus was his behavior all the time he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. So David is living in the Philistine country. He's raiding Philistine cities, but he's telling Akish that he's raiding Jew, the Israeli cities. He's lying. He's having to cover his track. You know, just think about it. You know, just kind of the spiral. I'm not going to trust the Lord. I'm going to live with the enemy, and now I'm just going to become the habitual liar. 
And that's, that, that's exactly how the enemy, or you, can, you can justify your sin. Because you're trying to cover. Because you don't want to get real. You don't want to be honest. You know, you, you, you think that you got this figured out on your own, and you know, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a, a, a payment down the road that David's going to have to deal with. It's interesting that we can so easily think that because Kish brought us in, because Saul hasn't caught us or Saul stopped chasing us, that, that you know what, we must be doing Good, or God must approve of what we're doing. Raiding these other cities and then lying about it. And, you know, I mean, oh, but God's, God's blessing. It, 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 you don't think for one minute that God will ever approve of sin. No matter what your circumstance don't think for one minute that, that you know, you can, you know, I, I'm just lying for the better good. No, you're, you're just living a lie. There's an interesting passage in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7. It says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. If you reap to the flesh, you're going to reap. From the flesh, you'll reap corruption. If he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. You're gonna, you're, you know, what are you going to reap? What are you going to sow in your life so that whatever you sow, whatever seed you plant is what crop you're going to get? You sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. You sow to the spirit, you're going to reap everlasting life, right? I mean, it just, it's just a biblical principle. It's a law. It's the law of God. There's, there's the, the law of gravity. There's the law of sowing and reaping. You can't defy the law of gravity. It'll win every time. And you cannot defy the law of God. It'll win every time. And, and David's going to have to learn this the hard way now, right? I mean, that's what I'm telling you guys. It's so, it's so amazing because you have all the lessons of life right here in the scriptures so that you don't have to repeat them. You can, you can learn from them. And, and it's here. Look, 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 look at verse 12. So Akish delivered David, Akish believed David in verse 12. He has made his people Israel utterly abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant forever. So Akish, and think about what the enemy's goal is. If he can get you to offend God, and his, his perception of things, now he'll have to be loyal to me. If, you, if, if he can just get you to offend God, then what are you going to do? You're going to run away from God and run into the enemy's camp and be loyal to the enemy. And it's how Satan, he's always looking to conquer, to divide and conquer, to divide and conquer. That's the enemy's goal. So if he can divide you between you and God, then what? He, he owns you. That's how, that's how he operates. And it's, it's incredible because, you know, God is never looking for us to be divided from him. Matter of fact, the Bible says this, if you just confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you for all unrighteousness. All that God's looking for is us to, to just get real, to be honest, to say, God, I, I'm guilty, I'm a sinner. I've done wrong, and, and I, can, I can go down the list of all the things that I've offended, that, that I've allowed my heart to dictate, my flesh to dictate, rather than truth and your word and, and, and your, your purposes. And when we're honest with God, God's willing to wipe away every offense. Matter of fact, he says this, that God will take your sin 
and he'll cast it as far as the east is from the west. And this is the cool thing. He says, and he'll remember it no more. It's, in, in God's eyes, it's totally blotted out. Why? Because the blood of Jesus paid the price for sin. Because that sin can be what, and David's going to be restored. You know, I mean, thank, thank God for his grace. You know, thank God that David's learning the lessons he has to learn. And you and I can, can be in that same place. You know, whatever your past is, no matter you know, what you've had to experience to get you to this point, you know what, God's got you here. Now it's just a matter, are, are you going to respond to what he says? Are you going to, God, you're right. I am wrong. I am guilty. I have allowed my heart to, you know, dictate my life rather than truth, your word. Or you can, you can go for another 14, you know, 18 months, 16 months, 10 years, 20 years. You, you, you know, because God's not going to force you. You can come back five years from now and go, oh, you know what? Um, I'm ready now, and you, you can waste another five years of your life. That's if, if you have five years left. <laughs> because no one knows the day or the hour. I mean, no, no, no one knows when our last breath is. No one knows when the Lord's coming back. But you can, you can play the roulette. You can just kind of spin the roulette and see if, you know, you get lucky. Or you can just simply just say, God, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I blew it. I, I want to get right with you. I, I don't want to continue one more day living in a life of rebellion against you, living in the enemy's camp. And that's why I, I love the stories of the Old Testament, man, because it just, it just, you know, you, you realize these men were just men like us. I mean, you look at David and think, man, that guy's a man of faith. He was a knucklehead. Just like you and me. All, he, all that's different about David is that when he finally came to his senses, he repented. When God finally confronts him, he, he you know, he he. he acknowledges it. Think about this. He has an affair with Bathsheba. For nine months, he hid it from everybody. He was pretending like everything was great until the prophet goes to David and he said, hey, David, you know what? What you've done is you've sinned against God. And you know what David does? He repents. He just simply says, you know what? God, you're right. I blew it. I've sinned against you and you alone. The only thing that made David any different than any one of us is that David responded. And hopefully, you know, that's where you and I come in and go, you know what, I, I, I like that option better. I need to repent. I need to get right with God. And the moment you do that, man, then God's able to work in your life. And so as we close, we're going we're to pray. And may, maybe this, this evening God's speaking to your heart. You realize, you know what, I, I, I need to get right with God. I need, to, I need to decide who my master is. Remember Jesus said, he goes, G Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one, you know, love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and he'll despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, the word mammon is the whole idea, not just money. It's talking about the whole world system. It's talking about, you know, how the world operates, our own flesh, our own desire. You know, you've got to choose. Am I going to serve the Lord or mammon? You can't, you can't serve both. You can't have two masters. You can only have one. And... This evening, man, it may be God saying it's time to choose. It's time to choose who your master is going to be.